Now, I've, I've been here 10 times, which is to say that I've talked about projects a lot of time. Last time I was here was June 5th, talking about a project to uh, prevent and uh, predict kids that have elevated lead levels, uh, elevated blood lead levels. So what are we going to talk about today that's going to be different than next? Well, behind every single one of these projects, we're trying to prove something else. We're trying to add to a bigger dialogue than just the project itself. We wanted these projects to speak to something about what civic technology can be, what data and analytics can be within government. Because Chicago was the first city to ever have a chief data officer. And so there was a lot that we didn't know what needed to be done, what was going to work, what was going to be effective, and how we're going to be able to take data and apply it to day-to-day -day life to improve the quality of life, to improve the efficiency of our operations. And beyond that, when early on I'd talk with Derek and I'd talk with other early founding members of this, we had big aspirations in terms of technology and what that meant for governments. That included things like greater transparency, improving the tools that we use, using modern tools, making websites that were friendly to use and didn't look like a government website, which is a design category on its own. So how do we do all of these things while still trying to maintain and do what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis? So today, we're going to spend the next two and a half hours painfully going through <laughs> every single one of these projects if you want to stay that long. But I'm going to give you about a 20, 30 minute just brief overview, reviewing some of the projects that I've been out here talking about before, and my team has come out here talking about before, and try to understand what does that mean in terms of echoing that larger conversation that is meant to extend beyond my tenure as chief data officer, meant to extend beyond the city of Chicago, and meant to extend to founding the roots of what a chief data officer in a city can be. Now, if anybody knows, if anybody's ever looked at our technology plan, which was, I'm sure, a presentation that we had here a few years ago, we always say that the value of technology, the importance of technology, is measured by those who are going to use and benefit from it. So technology, and of course, Shai Hacknight and this group has been able to come along, is looking at what is technology beyond its own rights? What can we do beyond just the technology itself? Of course, we have our data portal, which is one of our first big things that the chief data officer has done. Now, there's well over 20 chief data officers across the United States, and they all begin the same way, which is we want a data portal, put data onto the data portal. So how do we extend it beyond just that singular mission? We redesigned our data portal to be more user-friendly. Early on, what you saw was just a bunch of lists of data, just a bunch of different data sets in their title. But we really redesigned it. One, we saw about a third of our users were coming from mobile devices. So how do we make this more welcoming when you're out there and you want to take a look at something that's happening? How do you make that more welcoming? Two, we started using visualizations. John Levy, the open data program manager who's still with the city, him and I worked together to be able to create more visualizations so people can go and see information as opposed to just looking at data, spreadsheets of data. And that provided a lot more context and clarity. Within our open data program, we always think about five or six different user groups. There are folks like yourselves who would come out here, but we'd consider you fairly tech experienced. You know how to use technology. You can know how to navigate data. You, you know what these words mean. And then we have people who don't have a technology background, who are trying to use that data to inform their day-to-day -day life. I've been on the phone with uh, an elderly woman who was trying to use the data portal to figure out where that next alcohol permit in her neighborhood was going to be uh, issued. Because this is a real concern that people have, and they, she didn't quite understand how to search for something on the data portal. So how do we make that palatable for somebody like that who doesn't want to deal with technology? In fact, technology may not be the thing that they want to deal with. They're just trying to get to the information and data that they need to get to to understand what's happening around them. We have journalists and organizations, just like you heard last week from WBEZ, who use this information and data, uh, who constantly reach out to our data portal to be able to drive what they do. We have businesses and entrepreneurs uh, using the data. I've been week three, week four, at a director at KPMG now, and I've probably been one of the heaviest data portal users in some time. We've been taking and sucking in information from all across the United States and doing interesting things with it. So businesses can use this information as well. And of course, students in academia, how people have been able to use this in their classroom, how people have been able to use it to teach, and how people have been able to use it for s serious research. I've 
randomly read papers at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Any economists in here? Anybody know what NBER is? All right, a couple. So this is a technical journal outlet. This is high-end, very mathematical stuff. And I'm reading along, and I realize, hey, they're pulling in data from our data portal. They don't cite it, of course, but they do pull it in. You can infer, it's like, oh, they're pulling in the crimes data set, and they're pulling in the transportation data sets that we have to be able to use that. So that's our first mission. How are we able to use that data? How can we use that mission of making data more transparent, useful? And I just talked about the different groups, but I omitted one of them. One of the most important user groups is our own people. The only people in the city of Chicago who work for the city of Chicago, who work for the institution, who sometimes work for my team. And there was this period of time ago, about three, four years ago, I would guess, when we were working on a project, a project to better allocate our food inspectors across the city. Now, I think many people have heard me talk about this before, but we have 15,000 food establishments, and we had about 32 inspectors to inspect them all. So how can we allocate them better? Well, of course, we can use predictive analytics. We can use data science methods from data scientists, st statisticians, whatever you want to call them. Use those methods to be able to better allocate and predict which place is more likely to fail their food inspection for that day and allocate our inspectors to that place. But we set an internal challenge for ourselves. We set an internal challenge for ourselves because at the time there was this dialogue as cities were creating data portals and putting that information out there. Was that data actually useful? Of the avalanche of data that cities were presenting and putting onto these data portals, were these actually useful or were they so watered down they had no operational value at the end of the day? So we challenged ourselves by using that project and doing that project using mostly open data. Of the nine or so different variables, eight of them came from the open data portal. And in fact, we rearranged how we presented food inspection data in large part so we can be able to use that ourselves because we realized there was a huge deficiency there in terms of being able to pull that data out and organize in a way that a data scientist and a statistician would want to do it. So not only were we trying to do a project which was predict where to send our food inspectors to improve the efficiency and have a clear operational value, one of the things that we were trying to echo beyond ourselves was to prove to others that this data is powerful enough to use for operations such as predicting where to send food inspectors. And at the same time, we put ourselves into another challenge. We had a GitHub site, github.com forward slash Chicago, right? The greatest GitHub organization name that I think you can have. We already had that, but what were we going to do with that information? What were we going to do with that? So we put that project onto GitHub. And we did it for two different reasons. We did it for two different reasons. One of the reasons is because we wanted to challenge folks like yourselves. Because there's nothing more antagonizing for me to be able to come up here and say, all that code is online. All of that data is online. If you think you can beat me, do it. Try it. That's a hell of a challenge to put out to somebody else. Try to see if you can beat your government, see if you can do better than us. And a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I can do better than you. Oh, well, shit. No, they couldn't. We had, we had uh, several really good swings at it. And we did get somebody to do a very marginal improvement, just a little bit. Not, too, not enough quite to redo all of our code. It's kind of that Netflix challenge problem that they had a few years ago. Challenge somebody to see you can predict five stars better on Netflix. Well, somebody did, but it was such an incremental improvement, it wasn't worth the uh, reengineering. So we experienced that ourselves. So as we're trying to improve the quality of life for Anita here, who's a food inspector, you know, while we're trying to do that, providing that operational value, we were hooking in these other little things that we were trying to say, add to the greater conversation. And there's something about Chicago. You notice we just did it. We didn't talk about how open source could be a good thing. We just didn't talk about how high quality our open data portal was, that you could use it for these other things. But we said, we're going to show you. We're not even going to talk about it, we're just going to show you, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Because that's the way that we like to do our own work. That's the methods that we like to approach. So we did. We were able to improve it. We were able to put it onto uh, GitHub here as an open source project. We did have people try to beat us. But there's a second reason why we want to make it open source. 
because at the time we had a growing number of cities who had chief data officers. San Francisco had a chief data officer, LA had a chief data officer, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and these others. And then you had organizations like Code for America, and everybody was talking about sharing. How can we share innovations across everybody? How are we going to be able to do this? We also want to do it because we want to see if somebody would pick up our code and adopt it elsewhere. See if somebody would pick up our code and adopt it elsewhere. And cities have, Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, Raleigh, Denver, Syracuse, Louisville. Three different organizations in their own way have picked up this code and tried to adopt it into their own municipality. Uh, Louisville's local uh, hack night, uh, their local brigade picked up the code, rewrote it in Python and implemented it there. Uh, John Hopkins University picked it up and implemented it in three different cities that I've listed up here. And then there's a new company, Open Data Nation, who spun up, took the code, saw what we were trying to do, picked up that code and went to Montgomery County, Maryland, and had the business model in terms of taking open source models and adopting it to elsewhere. So this was a challenge, again, to ourselves and a conversation we were wanting to have. Yes, can we use analytics to improve uh, quality of life and efficiency? Yes, we showed that. Can we actually use open data for something useful? Yes, we've shown that. And can other cities share innovations? Yes, we have shown that as well. And we extend this beyond just analytics. Uh, OpenGrid.io. OpenGrid is a project, a situational awareness platform, where you can take data from dozens of different systems and throw them up onto a map to see what's happening. This is based on an internal project called WindyGrid that we've long had in the city of Chicago. And we went to re-architect WindyGrid, upgrade it, modernize it, improve it based on the use cases that we had. We said, you know what, there's something else. Let's take that code base and let's use all of that open data that we've had and also make this available to the public. So now while the internal WindyGrid application has more data than it's publicly available because it's used for internal operations, we can take that same source code that same efficiency of programming software to benefit the public and to benefit ourselves. So now not open data is just transparency, because again, that's what chief data officers begin with, transparency. It, it wasn't just transparency. Now we've blended it in, in terms of what helps us, helps the public, and how the public gets help also helps us at the end of the day. This is now a symbiotic relationship. This isn't just one way anymore. This isn't one way anymore. And so when we make an improvements to open grid, or sorry, to windy grid, you will also see those improvements into open grid as well. And I should note that this project, this open grid, there's a magical piece that was done, a project called Planario, who was engineered by Derek and Datamade over here. That was a completely separate project by the University of Chicago and Datamade that they pursued on their own. When we saw the project and we, we saw what was being done there, we just had to make a small little tweak to be able to take what was done on the Planario project and plug it into OpenGrid. So again, as we look across our own community, we're able to use software to bring these projects together and gain the efficiency of a $300,000 software project and bring that within our house and be able to benefit that from ourselves. It helps us save money. It helps, again, to improve our efficiency. And then we founded organizations like City Tech Collaborative. Of course, this used to be Smart, Smart Chicago Collaborative and, and one arm, and then it was City Digital and another arm. They've now come together into City Tech Collaborative. But we worked with both organizations, and we continue to work with this one organization at the City of Chicago. Again, this is an organization that brings people together, private companies, academic institutions, and government, to come together and understand how can we improve life here in Chicago, and how can we use technology, mostly, to be able to do that. And so there was this project, the Underground Mapping Project. So as we look across the city of Chicago, one of the problems and challenges that we have is what's happening beneath the ground. There's a lot of times where there's construction in the downtown loop area, and you'll get a whole entire section cleared off because somebody nicked a gas line. And we're not sure if it's a low-pressure gas line or a high-pressure ga gas line, which is a difference between big deal versus kaboom, right? So we have to take the utmost precaution. So how can we use data and technology to be able to do this? This isn't a simple challenge. So many cities have this challenge. We have this challenge, but can you imagine Rome and London, what they have underneath their grounds of layers and layers of cities? So this isn't a unique challenge, but there hasn't been a great solution. Why not? Because usually it just doesn't mean the technology isn't there and the partners aren't there to be able to get it done. So we teamed up with many others. Accenture, 
University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who pioneered some new technologies. We've worked with Microsoft on this. Of course, City Tech Collaborative, uh, multiple departments within the city of Chicago. To be able to understand how can we prototype and create platforms that bring this information together so we can operate more efficiently, reduce these accidents that happen, and for the most part, probably improve your commute as you're trying to get home at the end of the day. And this sort of mentality of going beyond and, and, and collaboration and open source extends beyond the organization in important ways. The Array of Things project, which is a partnership with the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratories, really began because uh, researchers at these institutions saw what we were trying to do in the city, releasing things open source, doing things collaboratively. And they reached out to us saying, you know, we have projects, we have ideas for projects. Would you want to collaborate with us? And we said, yes, absolutely. In that same vein, we'd want to collaborate with you to get these projects done. Now, building out sensors and building out a mesh array of network is an interesting project in its own right. But what's important is that philosophy and carrying that philosophy forward. So when we take a look at the Array of Things project, which is an open source project, the data is being published publicly. The designs, the schematics, is an open hardware design. So there's complete transparency into the project. So that ethos that we are trying to spark, that this community has come around, can carry out to other organizations in very important ways that will help the city of Chicago now and in the future. And we have projects like Clearwater, coming back to analytics projects. Clearwater is, a pro of course, a project that we did here. Uh, raise your, I think we got a couple people who worked on Clearwater. Kevin, uh, Nick, uh, hey, it's good seeing you again. See, we get to see all these good people. So we got three people here who worked on the Clearwater project. This Clearwater project was, in its own right, one simple mission. Can we improve the accuracy of predicting when there's going to be E. coli in Lake Michigan? It was no Scott Bezlow, who's a regular attendee here, was looking at some of the data that was being published at the portal. He noticed that we don't do a great job of predicting when uh, Lake Michigan is going to have high bacteria levels. And when we dug into it, it turns out to be a very tough research challenge. There's 10, 15 years of literature, scientific literature, of different attempts at this. And we started early on thinking about how can we use data te science techniques and this data to be able to predict this. And then we found out our own right, it was very challenging. And after we spent together about 1,000 hours between Shy Hack Night, interns who worked pro bono for free for the city of Chicago, we created a new solution. And when I mean a new solution, I mean a very new solution. We rethought how to approach the problem. And combined with modern data science techniques, we're able to improve our ability to accurately predict when Lake Michigan is going to have elevated E. coli levels by four times, by four times. And again, because of the new approach that we are able to think through, not just trying a different algorithm to try to outpower the last algorithm, but a whole new different approach, we actually got something that is peer reviewable and researchable. And so we've been working on and we're revising a paper uh, with a Journal of Water Research. Uh, uh, and we'll be making our revisions as soon as I get them done this week. Uh, submit those in, and it will likely be in a journal article here before the end of the year. So again, not only was this an improvement in contributions to the city of Chicago operationally, because it was, but it echoed beyond us because we're actually now making contributions to science itself, to the scientific literature. And there's going to be here, there's co-authors here, uh, uh, those who raised their hand and many others who, didn't, who are not here today, who have their bylines in that journal article as Shy Hack Night as the organization that they belong to. So Shy Hack Night will be part of peer-reviewed articles. So again, it's about reverberating beyond just what we're doing within our operations. And that's the dualism that we had every single day. We were doing a project for the project's sake, to make the operational improvement, so we could come here and talk to you about it, and so we could actually make that improvement. We could work with those teams, and people could see those improvements. And that hopefully you would notice the improvements by just living and visiting here in Chicago. But at the same time, we're always thinking, but what else are we trying to prove? What else can we show to this larger community about what can be done? What's interesting about that journal article I just mentioned, it's completely reproducible research. 
there's this notion within academia around re reproducible research, or sometimes it's called open science, where you publish your data. You publish the source code behind what, uh, what you did for your analytics, and even publishing the paper so other people can read the paper and not just being behind a paywall. And we've done this with our project. If you go to the Chicago uh, GitHub repository, you can find that paper. And you can find that paper grabbing the code and generating the graphs in real time. So you can see not just the words that we've written, but you can see how we've come to those conclusions. You can go find the uh, preprint article on uh, BioArchive, so you can see the early drafts of our papers. And of course, you can go and you can download the data from the data portal, and you can also see how we've manipulated that data as soon as we download it from that data portal. So now we're we doing things around open data, but we've expanded that notion around open science. And even more than open science, and the reason I don't like open science is because there is this operational arm of analytics where this is being used to help make decisions and help understand what's happening in the lakes. And one of my favorite projects was a project called LeadSafe, which I just talked about last month, so I'm not going to get into a lot of the details again. But save the safe for those who don't know what LeadSafe is. LeadSafe is a combination of two things. One, it's an analytical model where we worked with the University of Chicago and Data Science for Social Good, a, a fantastic organization here in Chicago that we've been working with for years. We worked with them to partner with them to predict kids with elevated blood lead levels before the age of one and being able to predict whether or not they're going to have elevated blood lead levels before they get to age five. So can we take a child now who may not have elevated blood lead levels now, but will likely to have that develop at some point in their lifespan? And this is very important, right? Introduction to elevated lead levels can damage IQ permanently. This is something that there's at least been two or three members of this community themselves, I've had conversations privately and publicly, where they've described how their child has been impacted by elevated lead levels. And 80% of the time, that's coming from lead paint. Paint is the primary source. It's easy to get into your lungs. Children will chew on paints as they crawl around the, uh, the house. So that's part one. That's part one, the analytical model. We've talked about analytical models. But part two is also very interesting. Because then becomes the question, so what if I know right now that a child who's eight months, years, eight months is likely to have elevated lead levels? What can we do for that child? Now, unlike the beaches, which are managed by the city of Chicago, unlike restaurants that are managed by the city of Chicago, or other projects that we've done with West Nile virus and, and buildings and businesses, these things are managed by the city. We don't manage individual homes. We, we don't directly care for the children. So we're limited in terms of what our scope can be. And what I've really come to like about the Lead Safe project is that we weren't the point of action. We were not always in the best position to be able to do something about it. So we created an API that we offer for free to other hospitals and health networks in the city of Chicago. So when a child comes in, or even a pregnant mother, their medical records, the select medical records that we need, get sent to us, and within a few seconds, we return back the probability of that mother, that child, going to have elevated lead levels, and instructions to the doctors about what they can do. And what I like about this is now the city is doing what we have best. We have the data to be able to predict these things. We are able to partner with others to be able to create an analytical model that can predict it very well. But when it comes to the actual action and intervention, it's left to the doctors. And we're using technology as that bridge. Technology plays an important part there, the fact that there's an API or something that allows one computer to talk to another computer. But now this is partnership, and now this is leveraging technology, not just to improve what we can do and send our workforce elsewhere, but to be able to inform others who are knowledgeable and in a position who can make an influence to improve the quality of life, especially for an infant. So I'm very happy about this project. And I'm Frankly, it was one of the projects when, no, when I knew that we finished this. I knew I felt pretty good about what we've been able to do in the city of Chicago. And I do think it sets an excellent precedent for future projects, analytics projects. I'm not just thinking about how do we allocate our own workforce, but who are key strategic partners that we can help who are better positioned to make a difference in quality of life. Another favorite project of mine that I worked on was the city key. Who has their city key? Who has city key in here? 
Jason, a good city employee. There's four other city employees who do not, so we'll have a conversation. <laughs> Derek has one. So this is a city key. This is uh, an identification card, right? Now, there's a big national conversation about if you don't have state forms of identification, what rights do you have? And Chicago is a welcoming city. That if you live in Chicago, you're welcome here. You have access to our services. You can live here without being uh, uh, harangued for not having an identification. Now, the city of Chicago is not the first to have a municipal ID. New York City has one. New Haven, Connecticut was the first to have one. San Francisco has one. Uh, a number of cities have municipal IDs. But this one's special in a number of different rights. This one serves as your library card, and your bus card, and your train card. And now you can get uh, discount prescription medicine with it, discount med uh, prescriptions with it, and you'll be able to use other services down the road. It's built out to be that way. But based on what we've seen in New York City, and in New Haven, and San Francisco, is that others would come and subpoena and take the records of who held onto a municipal ID. Because they would use that for targeting. They'll compare that to other records to try to understand where people live that don't have uh, state forms of a documentation. So when we designed this card, this card, even though you can use it with city services, contains no actual information about the card holder. It integrates with our city systems, but yet contains no information itself about the card holder. That way you can hold on to the card knowing that you're safe, you're not going to be discovered. You're, somebody's not going to come after you. But you can use it with the city services. This model has been now copied by Philadelphia and San Francisco. This change of how they're going to approach this and what the municipal ID is going to be able to do for you. And so it's fantastic being in the city here when you have a project come up like this. And you can take a step back and say, well, how can we think about this? Right? Because it wasn't just that we need to do a municipal ID. Because what good is a municipal ID if the only people holding on to that ID don't have a driver's license or other forms of identification? That card then itself becomes a flag, a signal, a scarlet letter. And that's not good. By holding that card would say too much. But this card has to be for everybody. And so by integrating with other services, by integrating with other services, we make that card palatable and interesting to everybody. I have mine because I use it as my bus card. I also use it as my library card. It's just a single card that makes life in the city a little bit easier of me not having to keep track of these different things. So no matter who you are, we hope people are going to want this card. And I think we have over 10,000 cards printed uh, over the last few months, which was a bit faster, I think, than we were anticipating. We didn't quite know what the uptake would be, but a bit more than we were anticipating. And it's great to see even the city clerk team continue to add on services down the road. So this is a great way to start out a municipal ID program, thinking about privacy, thinking about what the true meaning is, thinking about where the risks are, and designing technology to be able to achieve that. And internally within my team, stuff that we don't always talk about, or sometimes I'll talk about, was using things, more open source technologies internally, such as Postgres and Mongo. A lot of people think, you know, I, we use a lot of Oracle in our shop. I don't like them for a lot of different reasons. But I think this is a good time to sit in terms of why do I care so much about open source? I don't necessarily care about open source because of its own right. I don't care about open source because it's open source, even though a lot of our work is around that. In this case, what I care about most is that this is more efficient for the city of Chicago to own and operate. This is going to reduce our cost. And if we can reduce our cost, we can think about hiring more people. We can think about improving quality of life of our people. We can, think of, we can not have to think about licensing and where things get installed. And we can just think about more, what do we need to get done at the end of the, today? And just being able to install things, getting it done, so we can get our mission done at the end of the day. So that's why we need to always be thinking about technology such as open source technologies, because it does allow us to operate more efficiently. As I joked with my team, Oracle causes micromanagement. If I have to think about licensing, then I have to think about what the DBA is doing every single day, which means I'm going to stand over their shoulder making sure that things were done right. So things like that can cause micromanagement, and that's not what we want in the city. That's not what we want for our staff. So we need to think about how can we fundamentally change the technologies we use to improve the quality of life even for our own 
uh, employees and make it more enticeable, more interesting for folks like yourselves to come in and work for the city of Chicago and make big contributions to the projects I just talked about today. But these aren't overnight things. These are five and a half year long projects that won't get done and will need to continue to happen even after I leave and somebody else comes in. City of Chicago, we are a winner of City on a Cloud, uh, where uh, we got a lot of free AWS credits, and we started using AWS for a lot of different things. Again, slow project, but it's now introducing the new tools and the new technologies that make life a little bit more palatable if you're a technologist within the city. We use things such as R and Python. Uh, all of our projects are done in R, and an increasing number of our projects are done in Python. So again, as a data scientist comes on board, but why do this? Why start R with R and Python? Why not start with other data science packages or stacks or software? And frankly, in 10 years, I hope to see 10 data scientists at the city of Chicago. What I would be disappointed in seeing is a $10 million data science budget having to pay for different software that we have and only having two data scientists. Our mentality was the people are important when it comes to creating software as much as the people are important of those who are going to be using that technology. So it goes on both sides of the coin, where I said early on, the point of technology are those who use and benefit from it. That goes to the input as well. And we've been able to make those changes. And we've introduced new things like code version, uh, GitHub for public projects, and we use GitLab internally for our internal only projects. Again, the whole new way of thinking about keeping track of your code how are we going to combine project management with software development so people are looking at the same screen? These are some of your toughest projects because they take four, five, six, ten years to be able to get done, to change that mentality in terms of how are we going to develop software, how are we going to be able to get it done, what is it going to be written in, let alone the achievements that we need to achieve at the end of the day. And then finally, uh, something I'm also very happy about is the Civic Analytics Network. Civic Analytics Network exists across these cities, about 20 different cities of chief data officers, chief analytic officers, directors of performance. They have numerous different titles. Some of them are chief information officers. But we get on the phone the last Thursday of every month and we talk. Some of it's this therapeutic of just going through therapy of what was happening that month. Some of it was very intentional. I have a project in front of me. San Francisco, didn't you work on a similar project? How did you approach it? What did you do? New York, I know you faced this before. What can I do? Or in New York City, when we had the uh, municipal ID project come up, my first call was in New York City. I know you guys did this. What do you guys want to make sure that I wouldn't do again? All right, what would you avoid? And we get together twice a year. Some, again, for therapy. Some of it to think about projects. But when we get together, we talk more about how are we going to influence the entire market? How can we make statements about the future of open data? If we have 20 of the largest cities in the United States, you have any idea of what we can have in terms of influence and impact on the technology market, on the data market? This is classic monopoly. When you get a lot of people together, get them all together, get them on the same page, and then you can talk about how can we improve the entire landscape, the business landscape even, to be able to get this work done. And this is what's important. I've talked about projects, I've talked about how we've changed certain things, but the true measure of what needs to happen is how do these institutions persist and last? So this is a group of the civic, from the Civic Analytics Network, from New Orleans, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, again, New York, uh, San Francisco, LA, Seattle, Denver, all these different folks. This is the institution, and, other, and the city of Chicago are the institutions that are going to carry forward. If these things can survive and persist, the next chief data officer is going to be able to come in and have an easier job and be able to do more with his or her time. So how I should be judged isn't on the projects, isn't on we did this or we did that. It's how have we done and created our institutions to be able to persist those forward. And you're part of that too. I've listed a lot of people off here today. You know, the people that are on my team, the people who helped us on the Clearwater project, I've talked about being here 10 times and the number of times, or I've talked here 10 times, the number of times I've been here. Uh, we have you know, 50, 60, 70 people here today. So what else do we need? We really need to be thinking about at this point, we have institutions that have been formed. We have projects and examples that have been done. Where do we want to go collectively as a community? And what is left that's standing in our way? And at this point, if there's anything standing in the way 
We need to be able to make sure that we can overcome it. If it's people that we need to bring in, we have the institutions, we have the groups, we have the ability to bring people in, to have interesting conversations, to be able to program and create new things. You have the willingness and the cooperation of a city that's working with outside organizations to be able to get interesting projects done. We're in a, still in a good time where we can continue to grow the mission and the scope of what can be done within civic technology, what can be done within data and technology to improve cities and improve the quality of life of others. I hope and I would ask that when the next chief data officer comes in and takes the seat here and takes the helm at the chief, uh, in the chief data officer ro uh, ro role at the city of Chicago, treat them as you treated me, welcoming, challenging, me and challenging them, collaborating with the city of Chicago to see how they can do better, and act as advisors. Provide input. You have open and welcoming ears. All those conversations that you heard today, or all the projects that you heard today, there's conversations that we had. And it's this group, this team, in part, this is a very small number of folks at the end of my farewell party that we're able to stay beyond. This is the team that's going to be sticking around, that's going to be able to get this work done. Because they do most of the work. Right? They're the ones to be able to get it done. So take advantage of it. Take advantage of these institutions that have been created. Take advantage of the precedence that has been set so far. Continue to expand what has been done with the next chief data officer and other chief data officers who are coming in in the Chicagoland area, such as Cook County and, and other organizations. And this community will be continued to grow. Chicago will continue to be a leader in the civic technology space. And overall, again, everybody will be happier, healthier, and the city will be more efficient. Thank you so much for the time that you've given me over the past five and a half years and tonight. Hey, Tom, thanks for coming in and uh, reviewing so many years. Uh, can you talk about any valuable learnings from mistakes or failures that you've had over the years? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big question. Uh, so I think what we've, certainly one of the things that we discovered very early on is making sure that there's key business partners there, right? Uh, we, everything that we did was in partnership with something else. And that was the underlying theme that we had here, was almost everything I talked about tonight, there was a key partner that existed outside the city of Chicago. But even within the city of Chicago, it was the partnerships that we formed internally with other city departments that allowed us to get work done. If the partnerships weren't there and we didn't have enough buy-in, that wasn't going to work out at the end of the day. Uh, and I think, other, and many, I think every other chief data officer is keenly aware of this. Without those partnerships and forming those partnerships, you're not going to be able to get work done. I sometimes joke that the thing that matters most in terms of what a chief data officer can do is being a good middleman between the technology side and the data side and verse, with the people that actually have to get work done, who are under stress who are getting hammered because they don't have enough staff for people to do, to do work. Being able to bring those together is where to succeed. If you don't have that and you try to force it, it's not going to be a long-running project. And while you might get a short-term success, you're going to realize six months a year down the road, nobody's using your algorithm, nobody's using your tool. If you found the data genie and were granted one open data wish, <laughs> what data set, it can be anything from anywhere, would you want to be made public? So many conversations, guys. <laughs> so many conversations. Uh, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say assessor's data, Cook County assessor data, <laughs> which, which we hope. But that one is uh, property values is the cornerstone of what we have in the city. Right? We don't have real three-legged stools or anything in terms of a lot of different ways that we get money from property values and income tax or anything like that. We get sales tax and things like that, but property values is a lot. But what's crazy about property values is they, they can go down. Uh, we really have those fluctuations. And you can tie a lot of things back to what a property is doing. You know, is, is it abandoned or vacant? A project that we were working on internally that we're not quite ready for release. We're, trying to understand what does vacancy do for an entire neighborhood. These are big questions, and it, it's, it's such a smoke signal, or actual signal, for everything else. A lot of things are happening within the city, so I'd say assessor's data. Uh, I love the presentation, and I love the comments about the tech choices you made from like databases and uh, languages. It seems like you mostly were tending towards non-licensed, not outsourcing kind of some of those tools. 
except for AWS, uh, kind of outsourcing the infrastructure and IT. Just kind of curious why go that route? Uh, yeah, it, largely a business decision. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that's usually what I'm thinking about. So, for instance, uh, we have data centers right here in the city of Chicago. We already have that sunk cost investment into data centers. So when I think about EC2, I don't think about EC2 in terms of that's going to save me a lot of money, because it won't. We, we have the data centers here. We're going to have to keep them around because we got network and telecom equipment that we're never going to get rid of. Uh, again, it's a sunk cost. So I'm not going to try to think about, well, all that past expense and how to recoup that. That's gone. That's, that was yesteryear. What I do think about, for instance, in AWS early on, and what we did a lot of our work early on, was, for instance, storage costs, because that is a huge delta of costs, and it's a huge amount of efficiency. Um, we can introduce cloud technologies, such as AWS, uh, in terms of development, uh, dev servers, because we need a lot of those, and we'd have more flexibility there. But when it comes to running off production, the cloud economically is, gives us value, but in very particular ways and not carte blanche. Now, if I was starting a city anew, and I'm saying, what am I going to do today? I'm going to think way heavier towards the cloud, because that's going to provide me a huge amount of economic savings compared to building my own data center and building that, all that stuff out locally. So we have a lot of that stuff that's there already. So uh, the economic value is there. Uh, but we do have in mind in terms of how is this stuff going to transfer out to the cloud. Uh, you know, I chose Postgres uh, largely because it's ANSI SQL compliant. And it's very similar. It's a near cousin to Oracle in terms of its SQL syntax. And so when it comes to shifting from Oracle to Postgres, that's going to minimize my developer time in terms of how much time it's going to take to move my application to something else. Uh, Mongo is kind of a separate project entirely. But at the end of the day, these are business decisions. These are business decisions straddled in terms of what's going to present a very high ROI for me, what is going to shift the culture in the way that we need to shift the culture down the road, and just get us on the path where we're both saving money and also implementing a culture that we want to start seeing in the city of Chicago and our dev team here. Thanks again. Thank you very much, everybody.